Hello, wonderful staff of the Kent Northwest Kidney Center. Sorry this month's in-service is a little late, but the weather has been so nice outside that I couldn't bring myself to sit down and record a video until now. But we are back in action, and I'm excited to share with you another groundbreaking in-service, which will undoubtedly enhance the already superlative care that you provide our patients. Um, it's been a little while since I've given you a maritime history lesson, so I thought I'd begin with one today. Maritime exploration became particularly dangerous about 600 years ago when ships started traveling long distances across the Indian and the Pacific Oceans. Um, Vasco da Gama was a Portuguese explorer who was commissioned by the Portuguese king to find a maritime route to the east, so to India. Uh, in 1499, he was the first person to sail directly from Europe to India, which is an amazing accomplishment that came at a cost of losing two-thirds of his crew along the way. Ferdinand Magellan uh, was a Portuguese explorer who set out from Spain in 1519 with five ships to discover a western sea route to the Spice Islands. Um, en route, he discovered <clears throat> what is now known as the Strait of Magellan uh, and became the first European to cross the Pacific Ocean. Again, an amazing accomplishment that he made at the age of 29 years, but it came at a tremendous cost of losing more than 80% of his crew as he crossed the Pacific. Um, in 1740, Commodore George Anson of uh, Britain led a squadron of ships into the Pacific to raid Spanish shipping. Uh, Two-thirds of his crew died. Um, <clears throat> So why the high mortality rate? Why were sailors at such risk of dying when they traveled on long uh, routes? The main reason uh, is because of something called sailor's disease, uh, a terrible sickness that was well described by Richard Walter, who was the chaplain who sailed on the ship uh, with Commodore George Anson of Britain. Basically, <clears throat> there were multiple physical findings that developed as a consequence of sailor's disease, also known as scurvy. Uh, the skin became black as ink. People developed skin ulcers. They had trouble breathing. They had rictus or opening of the limbs. They would develop wounds on their limbs. Uh, their teeth would fall out. Uh, there was a strange plethora of gum tissue sprouting out of the mouth, which immediately rotted and lent the victim's breath an, ab an ab abominable odor. So essentially, they develop gum disease and teeth disease. Uh, all of their uh, tissue basically seemed to be disintegrating. There were also strange sensory and psychological effects too. Scurvy, scurvy seems to have disarmed essentially the sensory inhibitors that keep taste and smell and hearing under control and stop us from feeling too much. As Richard uh, Walter wrote, when sufferers got hold of fruit they had been craving, they swallowed it with emotions of the most voluptuous luxury. The sound of a gunshot was enough to kill a man in the last stages of scurvy, while the smell of blossoms from the shore could cause him to cry out in agony. This susceptibility of the senses was accompanied by a disposition to cry at the slightest disappointment and to yearn hopelessly and passionately for home. He wrote about all this uh, in a book uh, called Voyage Round the World. So <clears throat> in the 18th century, no one knew what caused scurvy, um, whose you know, symptoms were so varied that people thought uh, it might represent a number of different conditions, including leprosy or syphilis or dysentery or something called madness. Uh, and various treatments were proposed. Captain Cook, uh, a famous English explorer suggested that malt, uh, which is a cereal grain, and sauerkraut would cure scurvy. Um, <clears throat> some people proposed something called elixir of vitriol, which is basically a dilute 
solution of sulfuric acid. Uh, some people thought you should bleed them, you know, bleed the sailors, which is probably the last thing you should do to uh, someone who is already developing wounds and <clears throat> bleeding from them. Uh, some people thought you needed to put turf or basically grass to the patient's mouth to counter the bad qualities of sea air. Some people thought that you should bury your body in dirt. So as soon as you got to land that you should bury yourself uh, in dirt. And in 1622, uh, the explorer Sir Richard Hawkins wrote, sour lemons and oranges were most fruitful. I'm sure there was no pun intended there. I wish that some learned man would write of it. Um, more than a century later, uh, this wish was granted by a young physician named James Lind. Um, so he was a son of an Edinburgh uh, merchant. Uh, he became a medical apprentice. Um, in the 1730s, he joined the Royal Navy as a surgeon's mate. Uh, and that allowed him to basically observe the effects of scurvy firsthand. And finally, in 1947, uh, on the HMS Salisbury, he carried out the, one of the world's first controlled clinical trials ever recorded in medical science. So here was the experiment. He took 12 men suffering from symptoms of scurvy, and he divided them into six pairs and treated them with remedies suggested by previous writers. Uh, to one group, he gave a quart of cider per day. Now, apple cider has a little bit of vitamin C, about three milligrams of vitamin C, or about 6% of your daily needs, so not very much. To another pair, he gave 25 drops of the elixir of vitriol three times a day, which has no vitamin C. To the next group, he gave half a pint of seawater a day. Can you imagine drinking a half a pint of seawater every day? Uh, to the next group, he gave uh, a nutmeg paste of garlic, mustard seed, horseradish, balsam of Peru, and gum myrrh three times a day. Uh, this actually sounds pretty tasty if you were to serve it as an hors d'oeuvre, maybe on some nice crispy crackers or something, uh, but would contain uh, negligible vitamin C. To the next group, he gave two spoonfuls of vinegar three times a day. Uh, there is no vitamin C in vinegar. And the final group, of the final pair, received two oranges and one lemon a day. So I think I'd enjoy eating the oranges, but eating a lemon uh, might not be very much fun. Um, by the way, one orange has about 50 milligrams of vitamin C. Uh, a lemon has about 30 milligrams of vitamin C. So if you eat two oranges and a lemon, that's about 130, 130 milligrams of vitamin C, C which um, exceeds our uh, recommended dietary uh, minimum of vitamin C. Okay, so the results, basically by the end of the week, those who received the citrus fruits were well enough to nurse the others. And Lynn wrote about this in his treatise of scurvy. Uh, by this point, he was a physician practicing in Edinburgh, and he justly prided himself on conquering a condition which, quote, during the last war, proved a more destructive enemy and cut off more valuable lives than the united efforts of the French and Spanish arms. In other words, more people died of scurvy than they did of battle wounds. Um, even though he published this information, uh, and again, it was a small but controlled trial, uh, interestingly, it wasn't until 42 years later that the British Admiral first issued orders for the distribution of lemon juice to the sailors. So they had the cure for scurvy, uh, but a lot more people died over the next 42 years until they actually, uh, it actually uh, became accepted. Okay, so scurvy is the first clinical condition recognized to be due to a dietary deficiency. Uh, it wasn't known at the time that the cause was vitamin C or ascorbic acid deficiency, uh, but it wasn't the only disease that afflicted sailors. In fact, sailors had all sorts of vitamin deficiencies at the time. Um, in Japan, uh, there was a disease called Kake or Ido disease. Basically, uh, in 1883, there was a training ship full of Japanese cadets who were turning from a long sailing journey to New Zealand, South America, and Hawaii, and they became crippled by this disease uh, that they called kake. Uh, the Western term for it is beriberi. Um, out of the 370 cadets and crewmen, 169, so about 45%, developed this disease, uh, and 25 died. Now, the disease wasn't unfamiliar to Japan at that time. In fact, 
for several decades, um, many members of the Japanese imperial family had died of kake. Uh, it's also known as Edo because that was the old name for Tokyo where the disease was particularly prevalent. 1877, uh, the princess Kazu died of kake. Uh, the emperor had died of kake 10 years earlier. Um, <clears throat> the symptoms of kake were well described by the English explorer Isabella Bird in a book uh, written in 1880 called Unbeaten Tracks. Um, she writes, its first symptoms are a loss of strength in the legs, looseness in the knees, cramps in the calves, swelling, and numbness. The chronic form is a slow numbing and wasting malady, which if unchecked results in death from paralysis and exhaustion uh, in from six months to three years. So no one knew the cause of cocky, although it was long suspected to be related to uh, dampness uh, or damp ground. Uh, and there were a number of treatments that were proposed. One doctor administered uh, herbal medications and a fasting regimen to a samurai who died shortly thereafter. Uh, other doctors burned um, dried mugwort uh, and <clears throat> put it on pa patients' bodies to simulate chi and blood flow. That didn't work. But interestingly, some physicians prescribed barley and red beans, and that worked but they didn't really make the connection. Um, initially, kake was a disease that affected the wealthy and not the poor. So it affected the imperial family, it affected you know, wealthy residents of uh, Tokyo, but it didn't affect uh, the poor people. But in the 1880s, the problem began affecting all classes of people. And why was this? Well, it's because uh, of the availability of machines that processed rice. Okay, so machine milling made white rice or polished rice available to the masses. Uh, and at the time, the government was investing heavily in the army and the navy, and so it fed its soldiers white rice. In fact, that was how it added. It, it encouraged people, young men, to join the military. Uh, you join us and you can have as much white rice as you want. Um, now, white rice was less bulky, it lasted longer, uh, brown rice could go rancid in warm weather, uh, white rice tastes better. Uh, now, it turns out that kake was later found to be a dietary deficiency associated with eating the white or polished rice. Specifically, it's deficient in thiamine. Um, this was ultimately figured out uh, by a Japanese physician named Takaki Kanahiro. Um, so he was basically, uh, as a young man, he studied uh, Chinese medicine, and then he served as a medic in the Boshin War. Um, and then he studied uh, Western medical science under the British doctor um, William Willis. Um, <clears throat> and in 1880, he returned to Jan Japan and again became a Navy doctor. And at that time, he observed, you know, <clears throat> uh, that... The Japanese sailors were dying of kake, but the Western sailors did not have this problem. And so he figured that it had to be something to do with their diet because the Western sailors ate you know, different food than the Japanese sailors did. So um, Dr. Kanahiro met with the emperor. The emperor was very interested in finding a cure for this problem because a lot of members of his family were dying of this problem. And basically said, we need to figure this problem out and solve it ourselves because if someone outside of Japan figures out for us, it would be dishonorable. Okay, so he did an experiment. So as I mentioned earlier in 1883, there was this training ship full of cadets who returned uh, from a long journey out of the 370, 45% developed Take disease or beriberi uh, and 25 died. So what he did was <clears throat> he proposed sending another ship traveling the same route, same number of men, but this time carrying bread and meat instead of just white rice. Uh, and basically he uh, figured that uh, if, if the ship returned and crew members died from Beriberi, he would look like a fool and that he would have killed himself. But fortunately, several months later, the ship returned to J Japan in triumph. Only 14 crew members had developed cocky disease. And those had been the men who would refuse to eat the Western diet. So basically, it was a tremendous uh, success. Um, so Takaki <clears throat> basically believed that the issue was protein deficiency. And actually, it was thiamine uh, or vitamin B1. Uh, but since meat was expensive, he proposed giving the sailors barley, which is actually rich in thiamine. 
Um, <clears throat> so as a result of Takaki's uh, experiment, <clears throat> basically um, they uh, began issuing rations of barley to all their sailors. Uh, and within a few years, cocky disease had disappeared, uh, totally eradicated from the Japanese Navy. Um, Takaki became <clears throat> a, a Navy surgeon uh, general in 1885, but it's interesting, his ideas were not well accepted by the other physicians. Um, <clears throat> and so the Navy started eating barley, but the Army ate only rice after that. Uh, and during the Russo-Japanese War in 1904, Barry Berry killed about half of all the, you know, well, about a third of all the soldiers who actually were died in the wound, uh, in, in the war. So basically 27,000 died of very, very 47,000 died of actual war wounds. And after that, they realized, wow, we should have given our soldiers some barley. Um, anyway, so the bottom line is that cockade disease was caused by eating simple white rice as opposed to brown rice. In uh, 1905, Takaki was made a member of the nobility because of his work, and he was given the nickname the Barley Baron. Okay, so today uh, we're talking about vitamins and dialysis. Um, <clears throat> there are, um, essentially there, there are um, 13 essential vitamins uh, necessary for the proper function of the human body. Uh, vitamins are organic compounds that are necessary for normal health and growth. Our bodies may be able to synthesize some, but not in large enough quantities, and therefore you have to obtain these from your diet. There are two categories of vitamins. There are water-soluble, those are the B-complex vitamins and vitamin C, and there are the fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, E, and K, and these are the ones that are readily stored in the body, not excreted in the urine. Uh, excess consumption can actually uh, lead to toxic effects, um, for example. Excess vitamin A can lead to liver failure. Okay, this is a 20th century discovery. People always knew that <clears throat> vitamins or that, that food were important to health, but it wasn't until the early 1900s, basically 100 years ago, that these factors were actually identified and synthesized. Um, in 1906, <clears throat> the English biochemist Sir Frederick Galland Hopkins found that certain foods like proteins, carbohydrates, fats, and minerals were important to the growth in the human body. And ultimately, his work uh, led to receiving the Nobel Prize in 1929. In 1912, uh, the Polish science, uh, scientist Kazimir Funk, not to be confused with Frank Fung, who's one of the nephrologists with our group, uh, basically named the special nutritional parts of food vitamin. Uh, vitamins life and the amine from compounds uh, found in thiamine he isolated from rice husks. Basically, he figured out that, <clears throat> or he thought that vitamins were all, that all contained a nitrogen group, um, and they're called amines in chemistry. But when they figured out that wasn't the case, he dropped the E, and so it just became the word vitamin. And basically, uh, Hopkins and Funk formulated uh, the vitamin hypothesis of deficiency disease, which asserts that a lack of vitamins could make you sick. And this is obvious to us now, but back then this was groundbreaking news. We, hadn't, we did not know that there were uh, essential uh, components of our diet uh, and deficiency would cause disease. Uh, the recommended daily allowance, uh, basically is a suggested dietary levels of essential nutrients considered adequate to meet uh, nutritional needs of healthy individuals. Uh, requirements are influenced by all sorts of things, you know, uh, your gender, your dietary, pregnancy, lactation, age, whether or not you're on dialysis, etc. Okay, first let's talk about uh, the fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K, ADEC. Uh, vitamin A was discovered uh, by McCollum and Davis uh, between 1912 and 1940, um, <clears throat> and uh, in 1913 there were Yale researchers that discovered that butter contained uh, uh, large doses of vitamin A. <clears throat> vitamin A was first synthesized in 1947. And uh, tibia tribit. Basically, sailors used to develop vitamin A toxicity from eating the livers of seals and polar bears. Uh, they would uh, lose their hair, their skin would peel, they'd vomit, get very blurry vision, ultimately die from liver failure. Okay, vitamin D discovered by um, Edward uh, Malanby, when he was researching a disease called rickets, uh, and rickets basically most prominently features a bowed deformity of the, of the legs. Um, <clears throat> essentially, vitamin D is very important in promoting calcium uh, absorption in the gut. It enables bone mineralization. 
Uh, and many of you are aware that the skin can synthesize vitamin D upon exposure to sunlight, uh, and that healthy kidneys are involved in converting that form of vitamin D into one that is about 100 times more potent. So people with kidney failure develop vitamin D deficiency, uh, which is why we give them vitamin D with dialysis. Um, vitamin E was discovered in green leafy vegetables uh, by University of California researchers, um, Herbert Evans and Catherine Bishop. Basic deficiency is so rare that we don't see it clinically, but apparently it can cause nerve damages. Uh, vitamin K discovered by Danish scientists who are investing in the role of dietary cholesterol, uh, by essentially by feeding chickens a diet without fat. And after several weeks, they started to suffer from frequent bleeding. So in other words, they would spontaneously bleed. Uh, it turns out that vitamin K is very important in uh, the synthesis of clotting proteins. And as an aside, many of our patients take a blood thinner called warfarin. And the way warfarin works is it blocks the liver from using vitamin K to synthesize clotting factors. So um, that's why people on warfarin bleed more freely. Okay, now we'll talk about the water-soluble vitamins. Um, <clears throat> vitamin C, discovered by Norwegians, uh, Hoist and Froelich in 1912. Uh, it basically helps the body. <clears throat> it was the first vitamin to be artificially synthesized in 1935. It helps the body absorb iron. It's important in the manufacturing of collagen, bones, other tissues, maintenance of healthy gums, and healing cuts and wounds. You need about 60 to 100 milligrams per day. Uh, and deficiency, uh, as we talked about earlier, causes scurvy. Um, you can actually get disease from excess too. I mean, if you were to use massive amounts of vitamin C, you can get um, deposition of a crystal called oxalate or oxalic acid in bone and tissue joints. Okay, uh, we talked about thiamine. Thiamine is the cause of beriberi or cocaine. It basically was discovered in 1912 by Casimir Funk. Uh, it's mainly contained in vegetables, fruits, grains. Uh, we talked about barley earlier. It's important for producing energy from carbohydrates and maintenance of the nervous system. Uh, deficiency leads to beriberi or the cocaine disease uh, that we talked about. So that's why you want to eat brown rice rather than white white rice. Uh, it can also cause brain injury, so a lot of alcoholics become very malnourished, just deriving their calories from alcohol, not anything else, and they can develop something called Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, uh, which significantly affects memory. Okay, vitamin B2, riboflavin, discovered by Richard Kuhn in Germany, and Theodore Wagner, Jareg in Austria. Basically, a lot of good sources, eggs, meat, milk, vegetables, uh, and if you don't have riboflavin in your diet, then in addition to fatigue, you can develop swollen throat, blurred vision, dermatitis around the mouth. You can see the, the redness there uh, in this photo and hair loss. Uh, vitamin B3 or niacin discovered by an American, uh, Conrad Elvahem. Uh, lots of great sources, uh, meats, not meat, meats, nuts, grains, etc. Basically important uh, <clears throat> uh, for using sugars, fatty acids, producing energy, etc. Uh, deficiency of niacin causes a disease called pellagra, the three Ds, diarrhea, dermatitis, and dementia. So uh, this is a picture of the dermatitis associated with a niacin deficiency. A B5 is pantothoic acid, discovered by Dr. R.J. Williams. Um, Named after the Greek word pantos, which means everywhere. It's appropriately named because this is a widely available, widely distributed vitamin. Basically, it's present in all, all foods, helps the body produce uh, energy. Uh, and if you don't have enough of it, you can get uh, a neuropathy or basically numbness of numbness and burning of the hands and feet. You can get headaches, fatigue, restlessness, sleeping, sleeping problems, uh, GI problems, stomach pain, heartburn, etc. Uh, vitamin B6, pyridoxine. Uh, this is discovered uh, by Paul Georgi. Uh, helps the body uh, make protein, which is then used to make cells. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, alcohol develops, uh, promotes disintegration and loss of vitamin B6, so alcoholics are prone to developing pyridoxine deficiency. Um, clinically, we see functional B6 deficiency among patients who use the anti-tuberculosis medicine INH or isoniazid. Um, and so that's why whenever we prescribe INH, we also prescribe vitamin B6. Uh, deficiency can lead to a peripheral neuropathy, uh, seborrheic dermatitis, which you can see in this picture, that scaling rash, uh, glossitis, or basically an inflamed uh, swollen tongue, uh, confusion, and seizures. 
B7 is called biotin discovered by Elmer McCollum. Uh, helps cells produce energy, metabolize protein, fats, and carbohydrates. Uh, deficiency can lead to hair loss. Uh, that's why a lot of people, when they lose their hair, uh, for various reasons, take biotin supplement. Uh, it can also cause uh, neurologic symptoms. Vitamin B9, folic acid, discovered by Lucy Wills, an English physician. Very important to help uh, synthesize DNA for new cells. Works with vitamin B12 to make red blood cells. Uh, very important vitamin for dialysis patients who are always making new red blood cells. It's also called the pregnancy vitamin because women with folate deficiency who become pregnant are more likely to give birth to low weight, premature infants, as well as infants with neurotube defects. So if you get pregnant, you get prescribed a... Um, a prenatal vitamin, which has large amounts of folic acid in it. Uh, deficiency of folate leads to weight loss, weakness, sore tongue, uh, headaches, palpitations, irritability, uh, and anemia. And finally, vitamin B12. Uh, vitamin B12 was discovered by chemist Carl Folkers, who is an American, and Alexander Todd in Scotland from liver extract. Uh, helps make new cells, maintain nerve cells, and it works with folate to make red blood cells. So again, particularly important for dialysis patients. Uh, and a deficiency in vitamin B12 leads to anemia, so-called pernicious anemia, because untreated uh, people die. Uh, it can cause neurologic symptoms, neuropathy, weakness, dementia, uh, among other problems. So we actually see B12 deficiency clinically. Okay, what about vitamins and dialysis patients? Well, <clears throat> um, the recommended daily allowance uh, or dietary allowance of vitamin C for dialysis patients is 60 to 100 milligrams per day. Vitamin B6, uh, pyridoxine is 2 milligrams per day. Folic acid, 1 to 5 milligrams per day, as opposed to just 400 micrograms daily for a non-dialysis patient. Vitamin B12, you need 3 micrograms a day. B1, uh, thiamine, 1.5 milligrams per day. A little bit more maybe for peritoneal dialysis. Zinc, uh, vitamin D, vitamin E, uh, and other vitamins. Uh, the most common vitamin deficiencies among dialysis patients are vitamin C. Uh, basically, with a single hemodialysis session, you can lose uh, 30 to 40% of your blood level of vitamin C. Uh, folic acid, B9, is cleared significantly with both hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, as is pyridoxine, and particularly true with pyridoxine <clears throat> now that we are using high-flux dialyze. So you can lose over 50% of your blood level of pyridoxine with a single dialysis session. Uh, and then, of course, vitamin D is, uh, deficiency is common among dialysis patients because, um, we, um, because of kidney dysfunction. Kidneys, again, are important in the synthesis of vitamin D. Okay, so what exactly is the difference between a, a renal vitamin, nephrovitamin, and a regular multivitamin? Well, essentially, uh, a renal vitamins uh, just contain the water-soluble vitamins, so vitamin C and then all the B-complex vitamins. Um, a regular multivitamin contains all of those plus other things. Uh, and those other things include phosphorus, which we don't want to give to our patients, or potassium, which we don't want to give to our patients, as well as certain heavy metals. So <clears throat> when we prescribe a renal vitamin to our patient, we are prescribing the water-soluble vitamins, many of which are removed with the dialysis procedure. Um, so water soluble vitamin use, uh, it's the, the use of patient use among dialysis patients is not standardized. Uh, this is a study from the DOPS one trial. And DOPS one basically is a prospective observational study of adult hemodialysis patients. Oops. Uh, <clears throat> sorry about that. Of adult hemodialysis uh, patients. Uh, who were um, randomly selected from 308 representative dialysis facilities in France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Spain, United Kingdom, and the United States. And in the study, there was a large uh, regional variation of <clears throat> uh, renal vitamin use. It was lowest in the United Kingdom at 3.7%. In Japan, only 5.6%. You'd think that they would have learned their lesson from uh, a cockade disease, Spain 37.9%, and the United States uh, whopping 71.9%. So I think in the United States we really like our vitamins. Uh, interestingly, the use of water-soluble vitamins in the study was associated with a substantially and significantly lower risk for mortality. Now this is an observational study, uh, it's not a randomized controlled trial, and so that does limit the strength of the conclusion, but it is interesting that there may be a mortality benefit associated with
with replacing some of these uh, water-soluble vitamins. And this is also found in another study um, <clears throat> uh, published by Dom Rose, basically in clinical nephrology in 2007. Um, it was a single-center observational study of human dialysis patients looking at the influence of vitamins, among other variables, on mortality. And the authors looked at 102 dialysis patients, followed up for four years uh, uh, or until death. Uh, basically, what they found was that those who received multivitamins, so specifically a renal vitamin, during follow-up had significantly lower mortality risk than those who did not receive uh, this multivitamin. And the associations persisted despite adjustment for multiple uh, potential confounders. So in conclusion, basically multivitamin supplementation patients with end stage renal disease uh, in this study, as well as the previous one I just shared, was associated with reduction in mortality of all cause. Again, an observational study, uh, but uh, it does uh, make you think that there may be benefit from this fairly inexpensive uh, intervention. Okay, quiz time. Which is better for you, brown rice or white rice? You got it. Uh, the answer is brown rice. Okay, what is the major difference between renal vitamins and regular multivitamins? Uh, the answer, renal vitamins contain only water-soluble vitamins, uh, B and C vitamins, and no fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, K, in addition to phosphorus and potassium and other heavy metals. Okay, what are the four most common vitamin deficiencies in dialysis patients? Vitamin C, folic acid, pyridoxine, those three because the dialysis procedure removes those vitamins. Uh, and then vitamin D again because the kidneys help synthesize vitamin D. In which country are renal vitamins most often prescribed to dialysis patients? And I gave you the answer already, so 71% uh, in the United States. Vitamins can be divided into what two categories? They are... Water soluble, so uh, vitamin C and the B complex vitamins, and then the fat soluble vitamins, vitamins A, D, E, and K. Okay, uh, this concludes our in service for the month. I hope you eat a healthy lunch and dinner today. Uh, don't forget to eat some brown rice rather than white rice, and remember that an orange a day keeps scurvy away. Goodbye.